Welcome everybody to another highlight of our series in uh, Digital and Public Humanities organized by the Center for Digital and Public Humanities at uh, Kafoskari University. And thank you for Stefano Laraglio, Deborah Paci, who are organizing this and with support from uh, Elisa Coro, this uh, um, spring series. Uh, um, one technical announcement, so the, our, our uh, seminars are always being recorded and published on YouTube uh, shortly after uh, the events so or in the next days, so be aware of this. We hope to have a, a, a lively discussion afterwards. There will be enough time and we will use the chat to organize the discussion uh, somehow. So if you participate, please be aware that you will uh, probably maybe run viral on YouTube with your contribution. Um, it's a great pleasure, pleasure for me to uh, introduce you to our uh, today's speaker, Maurizio Forte, uh, from Duke University, distinguished professor of classical studies, art, art history, and visual studies, uh, founder and director of the DIG lab or um, DIG lab, uh, laboratory, laboratory for uh, digital archaeology. In the past, he had uh, various important positions. He was a uh, professor of world heritage at the University of uh, California and uh, director of the Virtual Heritage Lab. He was chief uh, of research at C CRN um, uh, of uh, Virtual Heritage. He received his bachelor's degree in archaeology from University of Bologna uh, and a PhD in archaeology from University of Rome, La Sapienza. He coordinated uh, numerous uh, archaeological field works and uh, research projects in Italy, Ethiopia, Egypt, Syria, Kazakhstan, Peru, China, Oman, India, Honduras, Turkey, the USA, Mexico, and uh, probably more places. Since uh, 2014, he is the director of the Vulci 3000 project. Uh, and he is editor and author of several books and countless articles on virtual archaeology, virtual reality, uh, cyber archaeology, and the application of digital methods and uh, remote sensing in archaeology. Today, uh, Maurizio will talk about cyber archaeology, uh, about the digital simulation and investigation of the potential past, and his work at the intersection between empiricism and virtual re reality simulation. Uh, Maurizio, thank you very much for coming. We are all very exciting to, excited to have you here. And uh, yeah, please, uh, um, the floor is yours. If you share your screen, then we just... Yes. Did you see the screen or no yet? Oh. Yeah, but it's not presentational mode yet. Oh, okay. Is that, is that all right? Yeah, that's, perfect. that's okay. perfect. Well, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. It's a great pleasure to, to be with all of you. And uh, I see also old friends in, in, the, um, in, the, in our community today. Um, so I would like to start with a short theoretical introduction about cyber archaeology because uh, the term uh, uh, might be uh, difficult uh, or maybe uh, sometimes uh, misunderstood from uh, different uh, uh, research perspectives. And first of all, there's some background about uh, cyber archaeology. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's not completely new. It was uh, introduced in 1997, and the first time it was applied to anthropology and communication studies. So this was uh, actually uh, one aspect that uh, of the uh, of uh, the work and uh, in between of research work uh, focus on the relationship between computer mediated communication and online behavior as cultural artifacts. So what I'm talking about today actually um, has a different story. So I introduced the term uh, in uh, 2009 during um, uh, uh, Stanford uh, conference, actually the theoretical archeology span group, uh, uh, so-called TAG. And uh, in, that cons uh, in that conference, uh, we, um, we created a, um, a working group on, uh, on cyber archaeology and, uh, and we start to discuss uh, the definition. We try to formalize better the definition in a broader context uh, later on with uh, uh, other uh, publications and articles. 
So first of all, the, what um, I'm inspiring to uh, is uh, the ecological cybernetics. And this is based on informative modeling of the organism and environment relationship. And this is actually well known as the second order of cybernetics. Uh, for example, Gregory Bateson and uh, his school of thinking. Um, I think the core uh, part of uh, this uh, uh, school of thinking uh, and, and is uh, that the observer is part of the system. So it is object and subject of observation. This is what uh, I like to, uh, to talk and to discuss mostly today and in relation, of course, uh, to different projects and the case studies. In short, the cyber archaeology observes that in action, simulation, virtual reality interaction, and 3D environment, but at the same time, he or she they be part of the same systems. So the goal of the simulation in, our, in this uh, uh, framework is to envision multiple interpretation, each of them consistent with specific methods of investigation. And this uh, is a, a very uh, simple um, uh, in um, scheme of uh, of the archaeological interpretation in uh, in cyber archaeology, where we need to intersect uh, digital memory and performance. In the digital memory, I list the documentation field where data entry repository archives and so on. In the performance, we have what we call um, the engaging layer. So the three D modeling, simulation, interaction, embodiment, and in action. And this part is the the one that we are now studying in uh, also in neuroarchaeology and uh, by eye tracking EEG system and so on. So what's going on in, uh, in, the, uh, in the performing side uh, uh, and simulation side of, uh, of, uh, of the cyber action. Um, the main goals uh, I try to uh, achieve in, uh, in uh, particularly in uh, recent projects uh, are based on the contextualization of different media object, uh, digital simulation, interaction empirical and virtual uh, which is something we should have uh, possibly also in the field and the multimodal interpretation process and um, i think multimodality you will see that uh, uh, is a recurring terms in this kind of research because the interpretation comes from uh, uh, um, uh, different processes and not by just one single uh, consistent uh, uh, digital workflow and then uh, I introduced the digital mind. So the evolution of virtual archaeology and cyber archaeology to me reflects the relevance dynamics of interaction simulation performance versus the predetermined static reconstructive process. This actually is uh, also based on the uh, cutting age evolution uh, from computer graphics and, and the static processing to VR real-time uh, performances. So the computer simulation create feedbacks, affordances, interaction, not achievable. Um, and this might be recognized, otherwise not achievable, it would be recognizable as digital mind and multimodal perception on the environment. Well, we combine ancient mind by simulation and modern mind by interaction. This is what I think is the core also of future research or so the combination of uh, uh, modern mind and, uh, and modern perception and, uh, and the ancient one uh, by simulation. So across the disciplinary contribution concerning embodiment and action in visual model, so the interpretation of visual patterns and memes and cultural transmission should entangle a neuroscientific approach. And this is what uh, I would like to start with. Um, I'm particularly pleased to, uh, to give you an insight of this uh, uh, new project. Actually, we finished last night some uh, uh, final, uh, semi-final, actually it's an ongoing project, uh, um, uh, processing virtual reality and neuroarchaeology. And I'm proud to share this with you because the list of, uh, of, uh, of uh, my co-orders are my undergrad students. So I'm really happy that we, uh, we contribute to, to this research in that way, and particularly in the COVID period where we had all labs closed. So this research had to deal with remote uh, processing and the network analysis, uh, but not uh, uh, with a, a, a physical meeting or lab uh, uh, activities. So first of all, uh, um, 
is uh, a quick uh, a quick introduction about uh, um, the geography of the brain so that actually this is important because at the end we we need to read the eeg we need to tr to compare eeg with uh, eye tracking and so on you see that the brain different colors of brain lobe uh, uh, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, and temporal lobe. This is important because we'll see that the data we try to uh, 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 interpret to come from this specific uh, analysis. So we see the electrode associated the function in brain physiology, and then you see the, the sensor that we use uh, in uh, uh, in our work. So uh, <clears throat> it's important to, uh, to see that every um, um, lobe uh, as a corresponding activity. So uh, that's why the geography of the brain. So the parietal lobe visual somatory, somatosensory stimulus is analyzed to send spatial information to the motor system, the frontal lobe decision-making plan and memory encoding the temporal load. Of course, this is a very schematic uh, idea of, uh, of, uh, of the process, but in um, data recording, but this is an example of my brain uh, uh, during a virtual simulation in our archaeological excavation in Volchi. So basically on the left, you see my EEG and uh, in, the, in the center, center right, uh, you see that the eye tracking. So uh, during the virtual reality walkthrough into the excavation, this is made uh, by Unity 3D. And on the, uh, on the right, uh, you see the in 3D, uh, the active part uh, parts of the brain. So this is actually how we collect data when everything goes well, at least. Um, and this is the virtual excavation more in detail. Uh, in uh, This uh, is a video recorded uh, during a real time uh, session, but uh, it, it can give you an insight uh, of uh, what we are dealing with when we place the experiment and we uh, start to compare different categories of respondents into the virtual reality system. And here we are we have the first uh, result of this research. Um, so there are C2 images here. This is the first uh, um, EEG uh, we start to process when we have two images. We have a distinct spike seen for the AF3, see here, and the, which is an electric signal in EEG that around the uh, a specific timestamp. So this covers uh, a specific area of excavation and it's related to the frontal lobe involved in the decision making and planning. So this is this, is a, this sorry, there is a distinct shape in the video and perhaps uh, this could be the result of the stick distinct signal generated in real time by pattern recognition. So we are not sure yet, of course, but uh, um, it's a, a, an, an important research question. So there are different uh, picks that we recognize uh, during the virtual uh, uh, visualization, and that could be part of the um, uh, visual scanning and pattern recognition of uh, an artifact or architectural elements and so on. We have more data from the eye tracking because the EEG, unfortunately, is more invasive. So we have a lot of uh, COVID protocols that for us, uh, for now, they prevent us to uh, to do more experiment. But uh, you can see here that uh, uh, in that tracking, we use uh, remote systems. Uh, that was much easier for us. And, uh, and in this case, uh, what we look for are regions of visual interest within the archaeological site visual dual time within visual region of interest and frequency of saccades and fixation throughout the experience. So this is important uh, to analyze in correlation to each other because there are a coexistent uh, aspect in the eye tracking that we need to uh, measure and evaluate. Uh, as said, because we couldn't use uh, any um, uh, offline, uh, sorry, any lab uh, facility, we use uh, uh, Gaze Recorders. It's a free online software that we can use uh, to collect eye tracking data, also by laptop, computer, and webcam. So the software tracks pupil movement via computer's webcam and maps its location via X, Y, coordinated timestamps. So, and, and, and we uh, created a very robust digital workflow from there. So data are, uh, are collected in this experiment uh, uh, by two different groups. Uh, um, the first group from non-archaeologists and the second group for archaeologists, they know the site. They participated 
uh, uh, um, uh, excavation in Volchi. And this is important because, of course, uh, we are trying to uh, um, compare visual special memory of two different uh, uh, categories of respondents and see if it makes sense uh, to split the two categories and that a, it, there is, of course, a different uh, uh, response and feedback because of that. On the, um, and you see an example here of uh, and he, what, what we call a heat map. So basically the red zone is the core um, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, visual focus and the green and the blue, of course, uh, the opposite. Um, we see here we can create the uh, uh, area or region of interest uh, with uh, we can calculate dual time uh, first view and uh, view by so the percentage of respondent they are focused on a specific uh, area and more uh, sophisticated analysis so that's our uh, quantitative analysis uh, conducted to determine what points in the video participant tend to fixate and qualitative analysis were conducted to determine, determine sorry, what aspect of the visual field the participant tended to fixate on. So fixation and saccad frequency analysis are both conducted in this case. And the result, uh, even very preliminary, as I said, I don't want to overestimate uh, at all this result, but it's particularly interesting and intriguing because uh, uh, non-archaeologist archaeology has a completely different uh, um, uh, um, visual approach to the virtual excavation, uh, as you see uh, very briefly in uh, in this case uh, from the heat map, we see more uh, uh, statistically approved in the uh, in this chart, and uh, when we see that uh, there is a, a clear um, a different fixation um, uh, 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 data from uh, uh, from both the category. So what we found here, so non-archaeology data within the group consistently indicate that the non-archaeology often drown towards holes, dark recesses, and apparently broken artifacts. So basically, this is mostly based on a segmentation of the image. For archaeology, it's basically the opposite. There is a, uh, th there is a kind of a visual scanning. And as, a, as a, we see also from the EEG before, there's uh, a sort of uh, path of recognition of the specific region. So the second group tend to stay much more on a specific area and uh, not, they are not attracted by uh, uh, other features, for example, uh, um, uh, architectural elements or broken architectural elements or other elements like uh, uh, holes, in the, which actually on the opposite attractive for the first category of non-archaeologists. Um, so the result is particularly appealing in relation to this. So the fact that we see uh, the excavation very differently. New um, eye tracking uh, uh, experiments will be conducted in the summer if everything goes well with an outdoor eye tracking system. So we will use uh, glasses in that case with uh, uh, um, uh, embedded cameras uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the experiment. Um, okay, so we had just a, a a preliminary introduction to uh, to the brain and, and the archaeology or archaeological mind. And now we move to projects. So I think that it's important to see, of course, a data set and other uh, multimodal uh, approaches to to uh, cyber digital archaeology. This is Volchi 3000, so it was mentioned briefly in the introduction. We, uh, Duke University, uh, start investigation 2014. And, and this is an important uh, archaeological site uh, um, because it was an Etruscan and Roman city. And uh, also because it's only 5% of the entire uh, um, of the entire Tufa plateau was excavated in uh, in the in the past two centuries, so it, uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's a big challenge for archaeologists uh, to to dig here. Um, we are uh, uh, digging a small uh, trench uh, here in uh, or more or less in uh, in in, uh, in the center of uh, of the plateau, but uh, we extended the non-invasive uh, um, uh, in prospection. Uh, all over the plateau and uh, also around uh, some of the funerary areas uh, of the site. 
And this actually changed completely the perspective. One aspect I want to uh, discuss very briefly is about the, the 3D volumetric data recording of archaeological uh, stratigraphy, so the unit. And this is something different from what maybe you are, we, we all are used to see. Uh, virtually or not. Uh, so you see that there is a pit here. This is a volumetric uh, unit. So it's the result of uh, uh, two surfaces. So the, the top one and the bottom one is actually the interface between this layer and the layer underneath. Uh, and this pit is actually not visible under in, uh, in a 2D documentation because we have, of course, to uh, create the different slices and not a 3D volume like in this case. Why I, I start with this? Because the excavation is uh, systematically recorded in three dimension by digital photogrammetry and uh, by um, uh, 3D uh, technologies. In order to extend uh, um, the uh, non-invasive uh, uh, prospection to other uh, regions of the plateau and, uh, and actually to know more about the site, we use uh, uh, a different uh, ground penetrating radar that are particularly successful in Volci. And this, thanks to the combination with uh, Joe Studi in Livorno and also with uh, the LBI Pro in Vienna. And uh, you see that uh, uh, what is an invisible area becomes actually a very populated, like in this case, uh, region of where you, we recognize several Roman buildings and particularly a domus, a second domus closer to the Grand Temple. And uh, this second domus, actually you see that we can count also uh, um, the columns we see uh, uh, an impluvium. And also we see features that uh, actually uh, not uh, um, not visible otherwise, also because uh, uh, um, of the um, the archaeological deposit is particularly uh, deep and thick. We are talking about over two meter and a half of archaeological deposit over fifteen hundred year of history of the site. So this site uh, has no modern occupation. And it's multi layered and stratified uh, in, uh, in a so long period uh, of uh, continuous occupation, at, at least uh, from the Etruscan to the Roman imperial period. You see that uh, the result of, uh, of processing is particularly effective here in the uh, GPR visualization, but also we can combine digital 3D photogrammetry, like in this case, is a late medieval uh, building with a, a basilic. I see the volumetric uh, um, uh, data set from the, uh, from the GPR shows clearly the size and the plan of the of a Roman basilica. And then we, uh, I don't have time to discuss all the details, perhaps we can discuss at the end um, in uh, our, um, uh, q and I session, but this is an example where you see in uh, uh, eight what you can read by GPR in the range of 80, 90 centimeters. And uh, for the basilica, we can also compare, sorry, the basilica with uh, the one in Herculaneum, and um, which actually the same uh, uh, shape and not the same size. Other example of a simulation uh, in uh, uh, by. Uh, um, virtual agents. So we could, it's a case uh, of uh, uh, trying to track the, the or simulate better the human uh, movement uh, in the Roman Forum uh, of, uh, of Volci. Of course, it's an it's a, uh, uh, interesting perspective to, to consider. And, uh, and uh, so on the left is a, a 2D map of, uh, of this calculation. And in uh, 3D, you can see the, uh, the movement of the agent uh, actually recorded by video. But you can, of course, uh, uh, extend the simulation for hours and see what is the result and then try to understand what is the relation between public and private space, for example. Um, and or, and uh, we can approach the reconstruction not just by a, a visual uh, appealing com uh, uh, reconstruction computer graphic, which is of course uh, very welcome, but also by procedural modeling. So we can write script and see how uh, the city can change according to new data set and new rules 
architectural rules we can place uh, in the code. And that's something uh, I like to emphasize, particularly when we don't know enough about uh, um, a, a city plan. We use also a uh, lot of different drones, as you see here, than the fixed wings and uh, copters, uh, and particularly because uh, uh, we are interested to see the multispectral uh, analysis of uh, of the um, of the site, and and particularly in the summer when crops actually cover everything, and it's really hard to see anything, any archaeological features in RGB. So we we investigate other channels, other sensors. And in, in this case, we use uh, uh, red, particularly uh, infrared, red edge, and the calculation of the vegetation index, which was particularly successful in the area of Volci. As you can see here also, the anthropogenic soil is very visible. It's this uh, dark uh, brown, uh, and, uh, in, uh, in, uh, and it, it can give us a, a, a clear uh, evidence of uh, of the extension of this uh, uh, soil. And we can, of course, track the soil more in detail when we match uh, multispectral data with uh, um, GPR, magnetometry, and so on. That's the, I think, the principle of multimodality. So in order to, to recognize uh, uh, correctly uh, or properly a building or a feature, so we need to, to have different layers of information. That, they are particularly helpful in this kind of analysis and interpretation. And the area in green it was a, a discover. It, it's kind of new because it was a never uh, was never isolated so clearly like in this uh, uh, image. And um, we have two uh, grad students now working on on all uh, these remote sensing data. They are all over six gigs of information. And in the northern part of the site, we. Uh, um, we uh, extended the, the multispectral analysis and you see that the T-shaped tombs right here, there are hundreds of them, they're very visible in this, uh, uh, in, in this picture, but they're not visible if you use uh, uh, simple RGB uh, images. Uh, for example, so uh, you, we can uh, elaborate the point clouds and this, the uh, Cucumella tumulus, an aristocratic tumulus actually on the eastern side uh, of, uh, of the plateau of Volci. And, and, uh, and, and uh, we ex when we work on uh, infrared uh, analysis here, this is what happened. You see that there's another circle, very visible now here, but it's not really visible on the ground and not in RGB. This is another interesting example of multispectral. Um, then this is one of the, uh, the monumental comp complex we are uh, digging. Up. We hope to, to finish our uh, uh, three years uh, of, uh, of excavation cycle uh, uh, in the coming summer. So if everything goes well. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, uh, the multispectral drone, this is a copter, uh, was able to classify very well some architectural elements, particularly the Cochopesto right here, which is uh, white. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, based on the reflectance property of the material. So um, the excavation also uh, revealed a, a new data about uh, uh, water systems. And uh, we start to excavate uh, a, a uh, a water system in uh, which uh, underneath the, the travertine building, and that's uh, the building uh, is Roman, but the system was very likely originally built by the Etruscan and reused uh, in the Roman time. You see here, uh, the, this is particularly important because we use digital photogrammetry in a very difficult situation like this in order to produce a 3D model. Um, very shortly, and we were able to georeference the model with uh, uh, by RTK GPS with the rest of the excavation. So, and 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 we are happy with that because it's the first system after so many uh, undocumented uh, wells and systems in Volci that is uh, completely uh, documented in three dimension by digital photogrammetry. And you see the results are really useful for the interpretation of the of uh, of this. Uh, um, of this uh, architectural elements, but also because of the complexity of the tunnels and uh, feeding conduits. So, so all, all the uh, um, elements are related to um, um, 
water management and water infrastructures, they were connecting very likely this part of the, of, uh, of the city with the southern part uh, where we, uh, I, we identify the uh, Roman Forum. See here are the example. Uh, every um, data set in 3D is a volumetrically identifiable. So it's uh, like in this case, uh, uh, give us uh, uh, not just uh, a, a section or a map, or, but it gives us a lot of uh, elements also for statistical analysis on the layers, on the volumes, and, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, one more example uh, of uh, multimodal approach to uh, a virtual museum and digital exhibit. This is uh, the Trajan puzzle project. Uh, was a uh, uh, release uh, uh, two years, three years ago now, but uh, in uh, in collaboration with the uh, Museum of Imperial Four in Rome. So the project was a uh, uh, focus on a specific digital installation and we work on the reconstruction of the Basilica Ulpia but the concept I want to discuss today is uh, the different the different uh, um, um, interaction we uh, we thought and we plan in advance for a general audience and we work particularly on three um, different uh, um, uh, approaches, uh, one, the haptic, the proprioceptive, and the kinesthetic. So, the, and then we we actually uh, work on uh, on different installations and uh, uh, and uh, and different uh, applications because of that. So, haptics or it's related to the sense of touch. Proprioceptive it related to the sensory information about the state of the body, and this is important also in the uh, in, in because the idea is that. The, the embodied simulation can create uh, a, a different kind of learning. And the kinesthetic, so the meaning, the feeling of motion, so the related to sensation uh, originating muscle, tendons, and joints. This is important also in, uh, in neurological terms because uh, uh, we can stimulate uh, uh, brain and body simultaneously, of course, but in that case, uh, we can generate different kind of learning because of the action. This is the Basilica I'll be today, so I, I don't want to spend much time uh, on this. It, it's of course it's a, 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 an important monument, but it's not uh, easy to uh, classify, uh, interpret, identify on site. And this is the famous uh, so-called Trajan Market uh, Museum. Um, the position the Basilica at the time, the Trajan was uh, uh, really important also in the topography of Rome, you can see here in relation to the Colosseum, for example, and more in detail here in the CAD model reconstructed on top of the of the planimetry. Um, one of the uh, challenges was uh, to create a 3D puzzle of uh, the dec architectural decoration of the Basilica. We work uh, uh, mostly on that. and. Uh, and we create uh, several simulation in order to uh, uh, to create a recomp recomposition of the architectural puzzle, and particularly this the freeze of the weapons. One of the most important aspect uh, of the decoration. It, there is, of course, uh, it's an ideological. Uh, 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 there is an ideological goal in, in the Trajan view, of course, of of the basilica, and this is one one of them. Um, so we had a team of 30 people actually working for uh, for three years on this project. A uh, lot of students. Uh, again, I like to say that every project you see here is a is a, a project made in team and uh, and designed for a team. And uh, and we are extremely grateful to all of this community of uh, student uh, colleagues and and others that collaborated uh, with us uh, because of that so for the basilica Ulpia, basically we made a, a 3d digital model but we made also a 3d print and we made also an hologram so the idea in this case is to explore what uh, uh, I call a digital redundancy. So the, the, the topic is the same, but, but the reconstruction is not the same. So we want to stimulate different way to see actually uh, a, a monument in, uh, in, in different views, in different layers. This is one millimeter polymeric uh, slice uh, of uh, uh, where you can see it was, uh, was printed in 3D 
um, uh, because uh, of this exhibit. Then you say, of course, it, because it's an hologram, it's, uh, it, it's, it's print on different layers. So if you walk around, you see different layers, architectural layers of the basilica. It's particularly interesting because it's uh, the prototype is digital, but uh, it's printed. So when it, one is printed, it's an artifact. So uh, I found this kind of multimodal option of, uh, of the visualization particularly intriguing for us because uh, we are exploring something different. Then uh, thanks to uh, several sponsorship, we were able to print uh, uh, in different labs uh, uh, several uh, elements of, uh, of the basilica and, uh, and then we reassemble uh, the 3D prints in Rome uh, because of the exhibit. So we have, again, a physical model, an holographic model, and then we have also a model. This is the, the model uh, before the final release. And then we have this. Okay, so uh, this is an example of uh, um, um, creativity, but also uh, a combination of uh, proprioception and uh, uh, haptics as well. So the uh, we call uh, uh, TIDA, tangible interactive table for archaeology. And, uh, and it's a prototype. So we invented uh, from scratch. It is not, uh, it's not a device uh, uh, um, we, can, we can buy or, or, or we can sell, but it was uh, an idea of a prototype designed for the, this exhibit in order to uh, simulate um, uh, the public to uh, use the uh, uh, printed, uh, uh, the 3D prints of, uh, of the freeze of the weapons as uh, a, a 3D puzzle. And, and then they play during the exhibit uh, a lot, and they and the idea was the challenge was to to have a, a, the the recomposition of this virtual puzzle on the screen. So, but and just touching every single print. So this is a uh, one example that of of the experiment we did during the the exhibit, and uh, we observed the public and for. For um, for several weeks, and was uh, I think uh, a very interesting uh, uh, teaching and learning experience as, and, and, uh, as well. Okay, so I want to conclude uh, uh, this presentation with uh, uh, what uh, um, with cyber publication or or better multimodal publication in archaeology because uh, I think it's particularly. Um, Important in uh, in this uh, uh, in this period uh, where we produce uh, so much uh, digital in different formats, so we have different uh, digital ontologies. Uh, to think about the future of uh, publication, the future also of the democratization of archaeological data set, and uh, I, I spent really a lot of my life trying to make uh, data set accessible and also trying to think new to experiment new methods for making this possible. 
and I was not happy with that. So I, I, I think we, we need to work more and more and more. So I'm now in a more optimist mood, let's say, because, uh, um, and this is the, the slide introducing uh, this topic. So uh, in, in, uh, in other terms, I don't think we can have uh, the magic wand uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the textual analysis can be uh, uh, just uh, the final goal of a publication. So in this case, Volci, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, as I said, several gigs uh, of uh, that digital data set in 3D format. They are not available yet online, but can be online very soon. And uh, some of them are available. And we start to create a 3D repository, more for source 2.0, which is now a standard in the United States for biological specimen. But we shift also uh, the mission of the repository to cultural heritage object. And we start with a thousand objects now available for the uh, vulture excavation in 3D with uh, uh, metadata in uh, uh, and, uh, and a real-time visualization on online. So the other uh, future challenge is to connect the 3D repository with Mozilla Hubs. Uh, we, we call this engagement layer where we can place uh, categories of 3D objects and interact uh, with them uh, in uh, a collaborative space because Mozilla Hubs is a collaborative space. You can go with your avatars, you can have a class with other avatars as well. And so you can have real people in, uh, in, a, in a virtual space. And uh, the, the idea is uh, I'm, I'm in conversation now with uh, the University of Michigan Press and, uh, and Fulcrum, which is a multimedia platform for textual narrative. So this is the idea to combine uh, hopefully all the three different three different worlds such as the textual multimedia so video and so on the 3d repository and database and the engagement layer so we can simulate that we can create a virtual museum of our data set in a publication online so this is something i like to to consider for the future and i'm working with this uh, very uh, much in this period. Uh, in order to give you an example for Vulci, so we have a, a data set like this one. So we have the entire excavation in 3D, we have a stratigraphic units and so on. We can use also the repository for all the stratigraphic units, all the archeological finds, all the data set. But then we have also GIS map, we have uh, other uh, information to share. And that's why the idea to uh, create a more of a source, but also a, a collaborative engagement layer. And in this case, uh, this uh, state of the art uh, uh, of the repository is the one you see here. So uh, um, we want to uh, um, reach uh, the target of 6,000 classified ecological finds in 3D and available line. I think we can do that in maybe one year from now. We have two grants actually covering part of this work. Stratigraphic units, the 3D landscape, a geophysical prospection as well, because we, we saw the prospection in a map, but we want also to see the, the uh, ground penetrating radar in 3D uh, with other data sets simultaneously. And this is the repository, you can see the, this uh, is the Aleph viewer, so developed at Duke University, you see the uh, this is a red, uh, attic red figure that uh, uh, posture. So we see that you, you can, of course, uh, work on uh, on uh, on the visualization. But there is also an important annotation tool you see here on uh, on the right. Uh, so all the nodes here are annotation tools. So this is the part I'd like to expand more and more in the future because uh, this is a head of uh, marble head of Silenos. It's a Roman artifact, but we can enable nodes and we can make a node interactive. We can have a backend node in the future where you can read what is this taxonomy according to the excavation team, but we can have other interpreters and not necessarily us that they can add more nodes and they transform this visualization in a multivocal interpretation, which is actually, I think, an important target uh, uh, for the future of e-publication e and the democratization of archaeological data, because this is uh, one of the biggest, uh, biggest uh, challenges in the third millennium. So thank you. I, I, I hope we have uh, enough time for, for a discussion. 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Maurizio. And uh, yes, we, we do have uh, plenty of time to, for, for questions from all directions. So not only from, from archaeology, which, which I'm sure there are, will be plenty, but this is also an interdisciplinary um, seminar. So everyone can ask uh, from, from their individual background. So there are no uh, misplaced questions here today. And uh, I mean, you showed many examples and use cases to apply on our cultural heritage uh, to make the data sets um, accessible, uh, as you said, uh, a life, uh, uh, your lifelong enterprise. Um, you can, uh, everyone is invited to um, um, leave a note in the chat. I try to read the chat, uh, just mention that you have a question. You can also write your question if you like. You are also invited to switch on your camera if you're not already in your pajama um, or already, <laughs> so depending where you are. And uh, yeah, questions. If you have trouble with the chat, you can also shout, so that's no, no problem. I see plenty of archeologist colleagues here around, so don't be shy. No, don't be shy, so we... I'm sorry, the video had the soundtrack, uh, not uh, not uh, an, an audio comment. So uh, if you like, uh, I can reproduce the music for you, but uh, <laughs> it, it's not really fundamental for, <laughs> for David itself, just a aesthetic pleasure, but that, but it, it had the music. So that's why I'm sorry that I can share that. But, um, yes, please, uh, um, please. questions uh, in... Uh, in video, if you can, so I can see you. At, uh, if not, it's okay. Also in uh, in yes, chat. Carlos, please, Carlo. Okay. So thank you very much uh, to Maurizio Porta for this uh, very interesting presentation, which I have appreciated so much. I have a question for you. Um, I have seen that you work on uh, new data you collect from uh, excavations and remote sensing uh, activities. Do you have also projects on uh, also on legacy data? So uh, data from uh, also old excavations, uh, for example, uh, reconstruction of uh, 3D models, photogrammetries from uh, uh, old uh, old works. Well, yes and no. It says, uh, depends on, on which project. So in um, unfortunately, Vulci is not particularly lucky because. Uh, it's the most undocumented site, I would say, in Etruscan uh, archaeology, and uh, we are not happy with that. I'm, I'm to tell you so, and uh, it's really frustrating. But this is an archaeological problem. I, I, I think, guys, that there's, I think, so many archaeology here that uh, I know at least <laughs> uh, we 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 have to face. So the fact that uh, if we don't document and we don't share, that there's no future for for this kind of research. That's simple. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, some of the of the discoveries I know also from Bullshit came uh, from the past from oral communication, verbal communication. So not not even from a, 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 a sketch or a map, nothing. Um, I work in other sites with uh, pre previous uh, documentation, not of course at, at the level of the digital photogrammetry we use today, but we were able to reproduce digital photogrammetry, for example, at Chatal Yuk in Turkey, and uh, where I worked for six years uh, with uh, Jan Hodder, and uh, we were able somehow to save some, uh, uh, say, decent uh, data set from uh, the 50s and the 60s, uh, and, but that's because it was hyper-documented, so even, you know, they didn't know exactly what to do with that, but they release it. And that was uh, useful. This is uh, the situation where you can really uh, reuse and re-elaborate. So something that was done for, just for additional documentation, but wasn't available uh, 
perhaps for a publication, but it's available in an archive. So this question is particularly important for archiving and archives, because old archives can be extremely helpful if they are reusable in a certain way and so on. Uh, same for aerial photography. We have uh, digi digitized a uh, lot of uh, photos from uh, the 50s, uh, no, also it's earlier, but not particularly Second World War after and uh, up to the to the 90s, and uh, and that was useful as well. That's part of the multimodal approach. So coming from an historical perspective and going back to the multispectral, you don't know necessarily what is the most useful one, but you have to catch the wild. You have to take the the best layer and combining with the new one. So this was the, the for the aerial photos in Voltu, We were. Um, much more fortunate so we, we we have a very good and useful archive not not enough unfortunately for the previous archaeological excavation and particularly but it's not just Volchi also for the 19th century where uh, there was a lot of looting a lot of uh, activities uh, basically for for business not for uh, for scientific documentation thank you thank you Diego I see here yeah. yeah, Maurizio. Ciao, Diego. Ciao. I'm so sorry that I uh, joined you late, but there was uh, another conference uh, that I organized, so I could not uh, leave uh, alone. So sorry, but it's really a pleasure to meet at least uh, virtually. And uh, I'm so sorry if uh, if I miss uh, a part of it. But uh, I would like to to ask you something. Some things that we are um that we are asking with our um, working group about uh, 3d reconstruction where it comes uh, with uh, uh, reconstruction of object where the degree of uncertainty is quite high so for example early middle ages houses or early middle ages settlement so for those kind of uh, data we know the plan we have uh, data about the topographic disposition but when it comes the third dimension so how the height the roof the color the material so we can make many supposition but nothing that is certain and working uh, in, uh, in another project with roman staff where at least they architectural line of the, uh, the structure is uh, shared or is a quite convincingly uh, defined. Uh, we started to, to think that uh, uh, in somehow working with uh, uncertain element, uh, preparing a 3D is a risky in somehow because uh, it, is, uh, it is very assertive. So you have to take decision um, all the time. And uh, when you publish it, when you, uh, when you make public, you run the risk that uh, the uncertainty and the work that there is behind in terms of uh, um, interpretation is a little bit misunderstood by the public. Uh, moreover, by the public that uh, uh, will get access only the 3D without the uh, the bunch of paper that is behind that is saying, okay, we can think this and this and this. So what, and I like very much your, the, the, your last uh, part of your presentation where you're saying this, uh, this way of publishing and noting and uh, also making a, a share, uh, um, a share debate about, about it. So uh, do you think that in somehow we are, uh, we are ready now to, uh, to use 3D also for modeling things that we have in mind, uh, but they are not exactly uh, the uh, reproduction of the data that we collect, or at least they are based on, but there is a lot of post-processual thinking, uh, talking about it. So what do you think about that? Uh, how, what is your suggestion to do that? Because the first thing that we do, okay, let's do a drawing like we did in the 80s and let's call an artist. He will put some color, the, the watercolors and this blurred draw, uh, it, it help us to, uh, uh, to convey our uncertainty. Well, Ed, uh, thank you. You, you put me in a difficult situation. Yeah, because, I, uh, <laughs> I, 
I have a very radical position, and I know that is uh, several colleagues uh, do not uh, uh, do not approve much, but uh, it's well known. So I I believe that. Uh, um, of course, we discussed, this is an important topic. Uh, it was discussed, it's still discussed in several conferences. I don't want to underestimate this, it's important. Uh, my position is, is perhaps very simple. So I believe that multiple interpretation uh, creates a, a better understanding rather than less. So what, uh, and I, I work uh, also with other uh, colleagues here, see Alessandra, Eleonora, for example, in the past. Uh, and look, if we didn't, try something uh, like a reconstruction and so on, there was no way even to stimulate a debate, right? Uh, and I know also for the Basilica, I, I had, uh, uh, I received very nasty emails from other uh, distinguished professor that was thinking that, uh, oh, that's not, that's Carandini, that's, of course, I, 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 I don't want to make anybody upset, but the fact is that uh, he, it's, it's, it's okay to try that because it's part of the heuristic process. So if the heuristic process is based by attempt, has to be multivocal, has to be shareable, and we don't have to be, there's nothing to, to hide at the end. Of course, uh, w the only criteria, and I, I like to quote uh, for that, uh, the London Charter, for example, it's, uh, based on, on the metadata you use and, uh, and the consistency of the process. So basically like a, like a research paper, I start with this, I, I came with that and I explain why. So when they say that, that's, it's a, it's a, the level of uncertainty is part of it. But look, this is what I call 3D panic. When something is 3D, it seems peremptory, the final one, no one can tell, go back, it's the end of the world. If it's published in a paper, it's okay. It's super yeah. okay, right? Nobody can argue anything. The level of uncertainty is unbelievable. The theories are not sustainable in any place, but it's on paper. And then you can say, perhaps, uh, maybe, yeah. uh, unfortunately, or, or whatever, you use a different... Um, uh, you can rephrase that, but the concept is the same. We do, we deal with uncertainty. So this is visual. So the visual has a clear different feedback because you, you believe that uh, uh, you should trust the visual more than anything else, which is not true. And, and uh, But it can help to, uh, to contextualize the discussion and also to perhaps uh, to create a new research question. For example, what you are saying about uh, medieval object and so on, this is, is a great case because uh, if you don't do that, you don't have the research question in order to move on. In fact, uh, when, and I remember several scientific uh, uh, committees in the uh, Regium Lepidi project uh, in, uh, in Italy or in the Vulture and so on, where we start to discuss because we had something some data set finally. Uh, I have to quote also the excavation of other um, archaeologists uh, in the 80s in, uh, in the modern cities. And they, after the reconstruction, they start to review the, the article they published in the 80s. But not because uh, they, were, we, they were thinking that our reconstruction was right, but because we were trying to prove that it was possible to argue differently. So in other terms, I believe that debate uh, is extremely helpful, is important. And uh, we don't have to be uh, intimidated by the fact it's 3D and then we, we don't have to deal with. It's 3D, it's okay. And, um, and my experience is, uh, is the fact that uh, this discussion produce more knowledge. If, for example, new article, a new, uh, new ideas and new questions because several times what you read in a in a in a narrative sentence is not sustainable in in a 3d reconstruction simply because you don't have all the data set you think you have yeah. and and i i i have a joke uh, and i conclude and i i use with uh, some of my classes and uh, particularly when we deal with uh, ancient mind and so on and I see okay uh, i show them a modern a computer mouse and everybody recognized the mouse. But then we do another experiment is, okay, 
Now, you, you cannot say mouse, and you cannot say computer. Describe the taxonomy of, of a computer mouse. Nobody can understand what is a mouse. This is an example of a different kind of uh, para metadata. So if you use a, a, a visual uh, form, or a, a, a shape, a, the shape is recognizable. If you use a, a long narrative, perhaps you don't recognize the object. So both are important. That's my, my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Federico, I, I think. Uh, yes, hello. So congratulations for the very nice presentation. I would ask you some clarification about the concept of simulation, because for me, it's like quite clear the idea to simulate a building, for example. So it is a way to, to, to produce a 3D hypothesis, also to repeat this process. But what about the idea to simulate, you know, the perception of, the, of a, a 3D reconstructed environment? Because my concern is related to the fact that with the exception of some, you know, uh, very well preserved preserved sites such as Pompeii, I don't know, other exception, exceptionally well preserved sites. In most cases, uh, you know, the 3D reconstruction of a, a, a specified a specific environment is already the result of a simulation. So, uh, what do you think about this this thing that you know, if you simulate something within an environment that is already simulated, don't you think that you are going to introduce too, you know, uh, too many hypotheses. What do you think about this point? No, you're, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, you're absolutely right. You introduce more hypotheses, but that's the principle uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of cyber ecology. So actually the more simulation, the better. And when I say simulation, perhaps I, I, I need to uh, uh, specify uh, maybe uh, better. I, 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 I think also about different level of interaction, not just the reconstruction, because the reconstruction is just one part of it. It's not, it's not the whole. So there are a lot of uh, human, human behaviors we can uh, simulate through the interaction in the 3D space in VR and so on. Uh, an interesting example, uh, we, we started to use systematically in several classes, then unfortunately because the COVID we interrupt the experiment, so I don't have any anything to show but uh, I, uh, I had experience with uh, with uh, with all these students so basically we use the same model uh, some of them uh, some of the ones that you you saw before um, and particularly uh, a Roman basilica because I think it, this is the idea of a public space which is uh, very important to to communicate then you can see every basilica is different uh, uh, in the uh, early imperium period, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's an Augustium or a Basilica, you know, there is also this kind of misconception, what is a Basilica, what does uh, a Basilica mean, but it's a big, important public space. So even if I put the scale, if I create uh, all the possible uh, narrative and uh, textual narrative and so on, or slides, uh, nobody can really get the sense of it until they use a virtual reality headset. So when you use the virtual reality headset, they see the model on scale. They see the volume, actually, really the impact, the visual impact of that uh, ceilings, for example, turning around, something very simple. I don't, I don't talk about just the gaming level of interaction, just the pure observation and visualization of the space and the colors and, and so on. So this is a completely different perspective because uh, uh, in that case, uh, uh, the headset or in this case, or can be augmented reality in another case. So that's why I'm, I'm, I insist on the importance of the interaction can change and modify actually the, uh, uh, the capacity to learn that specific uh, object or context. So, and, and that's why multiple hypotheses can coexist, for example, can be compared if there is the right system to do that. Unfortunately, I don't believe that desktop applications are particularly uh, helpful on that. We, we, uh, we notice already, when they, that's why we, we study fixation, you know, 
I measure, I measure in dual time of the student when I, I change the simulation. I can tell you that's completely different. Of course, it's not the entire world. The fixation, dual time, uh, eye tracking, plus EEG. So there, there are a lot of things to combine, but we know that this has an impact. We call this spatial embodiment or embodied simulation. So the, that's important because uh, other studies in neuroscience, for example, already demonstrated that uh, this uh, and body simulation can accelerate the, the learning and it can stimulate different parts of the brain, which means that I can have more ideas. So more engagement, more simulation, more idea, more feedback. I know that's not for tomorrow. I don't want to, again, to never overestimate what we do, but I'm extremely confident that we can do more if we work on that and that we can really, uh, 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 exaggerate sometimes also uh, the simulation in order to, to collect more data in order to have a more uh, more input, more feedback and so on. So this is the, I know if I answer completely your questions, but this no, no. is my, my idea yes. of simulation. Thank you, thank you. So if I can just one last thing. So, but you know, so the idea is that uh, the way we perceive a, you know, a landscape or an environment today is the same way uh, you know, Roman people could perceive the same, let's say, environment. What do you think? Uh, what do you think about this point? No. Uh, this and I finish. Another... Sorry, because I want to. to but it's very interesting. I'm curious to, to know your no, no. idea, since well, you are the father of cyber archaeology. So it is, you know. No, no. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that uh, a lot, and um, and hope I will be in Italy. So for one year. So I hope that uh, to. Uh, to uh, I'm vaccinated, so perhaps one day we can meet and uh, sure, sure. Uh, we can talk in person. But uh, um, no, this is an important question. Actually, uh, what you're uh, asking is related with, with, with a biocultural uh, uh, attitude to, uh, to see a landscape and so on. So, and that's part of the, of, of the research question we have also in the experiment we are dealing with. So the perception of, of uh, of space is the same because it's biological, but the cultural interpretation of the space, so place making, is cultural. So it's really hard to, uh, for now, reproduce uh, the cultural one because we are not Romans, of course. But we can try to simulate something close by in the future. Uh, for example, if we can uh, uh, emphasize. Uh, the perception in a public space, or we can uh, make distinctive specific regions of the city where we know that the, the movement, that the human interaction was different. That's why the little, you, you see the little puppets moving around. It, it seems a silly experiment, but in, in that perspective, uh, uh, it's not because uh, it, it, we know that the space is not neutral. And, and that's why the simulation, the space is not neutral. When we see a map, actually, we don't interpret the space. We create a topography, which is a, a first level of discrimination, but then we have to use the space. And the use of the space maybe is different. Um, and this is one, one more aspect, uh, I think, to distinguish. So the, the biocultural uh, uh, bio study is, is really crucial. What, uh, I can quote other studies because I don't want to be uh, uh, self-referential on that. But uh, uh, there are other studies, for example, on archaeoacoustics uh, in uh, Tarquinia, the Truscan tombs. They demonstrate the use uh, of sounds uh, in the in the Truscan times, and these uh, simulations are extremely convincing. I it was presented last January in an international conference. Uh, I was impressed, but all the community was really impressed and convinced that was uh, a good, uh, uh, promising research uh, uh, track. So there, that's why the simulation. So we cannot be a trust can, but we can see what happens in a specific place. Maybe if we if we investigate different factors we did investigate before, such as, for example, perception, such as combination of colors, pattern. Uh, uh, spatial memory, this is important too. For example, the perception of space cannot be the same. If maybe if you are a slave, you go to the basilica, or if you are an aristocrat, right? This is an assumption, but that we have to make this uh, more tangible and more useful uh, for, uh, uh, for a scientific approach. 
we are at the very beginning of a long, uh, a very long trip uh, again. But uh, I think we have now new research questions. This is what uh, uh, make, makes me more optimist, not because uh, I have a lot of convinced result now, but because I think we have now more questions in the right place, better questions also. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There's a question from Ovidio, that's right. Yeah, hello. Uh, my question is uh, in response to your response. Uh, is possible to make a simulation to see how the landscape has changed based on uh, another kind of um, uh, research? Uh, I mean, if uh, in so many years I work on a prehistoric site and uh, the changes in um, in uh, the landscape. I mean, the forest uh, and uh, how uh, the uh, topography of the site has changed uh, past the years. I'm sorry, my English is not very good, sorry. Uh, no, no I was, and if it's possible to see the changes, I mean, uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, risk. Yes, uh, uh, well, this is, uh, this is important for the landscape, but also more in general. So first of all, uh, we need to have uh, enough paleoenvironmental uh, data available. So I mean, paleobotany, fauna and so on. So this is something is necessary to have in the at the, at the scale uh, at, the, at the level of the landscape uh, or landscape scale, and then uh, well we, we did it for example uh, in uh, again uh, the regional epidemic project we reconstructed the Roman landscape uh, in the first uh, second century uh, CE just because uh, we had enough uh, uh, publication to use uh, uh, in relation to to that that uh, region of the landscape we. Are, we, we, we started to reconstruct. Also, we made a sort of a diachronic transformation of the landscape from Roman times up to, until today. And uh, so that's really possible. But in other uh, projects, uh, for example, in particularly in, the, in uh, Lazio and near Rome, so where the landscape is very conservative, uh, um, we're able to demonstrate actually the transformation of the, Rome, of the modern landscape is based, uh, dramatically based on the Etruscan and Roman times. So that actually there, there is a strong link between uh, the modern and, uh, and the ancient one. Um, so this is uh, uh, technically very possible, but then it's important to have access to all the uh, all the all the paleoenvironmental data actually, it, uh, and uh, not, unfortunately, not many sites have uh, all uh, all the data available for this. For example, uh, you know, uh, pollens or uh, paleontological studies in combination with other environmental studies can can give us the the, uh, the opportunity to 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 reconstruct that. And then back to the uh, Federico's questions, you can see, for example, the difference between uh, uh, a landscape uh, um, in, uh, in, in, a different, in, in different periods of time, but also in, according to different perceptions, so you can visualize a different part according to that. Uh, some other simulations are, for example, uh, line of sight, uh, for example, uh, spatial analysis that we can start to track uh, uh, different parts of the landscape, visibility and, and so on. So there, so if you, once you have the right uh, database, then you can really play a lot with it and you can have a, uh, you can collect really interesting information for a visual, a very convincing simulation. Uh, that's, that's right. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I, I can read it from the chat or give them if you want to read it. Just up if you are, if you want. 
want me to answer? You sure, sure. I mean, it was easier to write, so I uh, just wrote it, but it was really interesting. Thank you for the presentation. I mean, I've been following your work, obviously, and it was really interesting to see uh, the recent uh, research uh, you have been working on. And it was particularly interesting, the narrow archaeology um, part. And I was wondering if you are continuing uh, uh, the research in this area, and if you're also collaborating with the medical um, uh, faculty. Thank you. Thank you. Agizem, you, you, you read my mind, <laughs> because uh, I just started a, a new collaboration with the medical lab at La Sapienza in Rome, and uh, we will start uh, in, uh, in the summer. And um, I can tell you more in a second. So first of all, uh, um, Yes, the, the, this project, uh, sorry that I have just preliminary result to share today, but uh, um, I thought that this part of uh, neuroarchaeology was uh, important in order to explain maybe better with uh, some uh, semi-tangible result, uh, which recent direction we are now. Um, we, we just started uh, in, uh, in, uh, in my university, but not just in mine, we are, uh, we collaborate with the Center of Neurostatics of uh, uh, Penn University, uh, and uh, I'm all, always uh, uh, constantly uh, discuss my hypothesis with Vittorio Galese, who is a great friend of mine, as one of the uh, top neuroscientists worldwide. So we have a, a good network uh, in, 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 in this case. Uh, you are right because about uh, there is a project uh, in um, um, uh, title uh, the Mich Michelangelo effects. I don't know if uh, it's an Italian project. I don't know if you, if someone uh, uh, in uh, this virtual room uh, heard about it. Did you? Anybody? No, no one. Okay, well that's good to talk about. Um, um, uh, the leader of this project is uh, Professor Marco Iosa from uh, uh, La Sapienza. Okay, so and, they, and that's why the uh, the question from Gizem is uh, is very much related. So uh, they start to well, this is about neuro uh, science and in uh, for um, treating Parkinson's and strokes by virtual reality and that's why that's why you will see that there is an interesting connection in our discussion so what um, uh, marco uh Yosa demonstrated and um, and published also is that uh, once uh, they uh gave all these patients uh, after a stroke basically they shake they have a different control of the body as you know they start to uh, they they create an app uh, where uh, actually the patient can discover very visually virtually with an headset an important artifact uh, Botticelli Michelangelo uh, Leonardo and so on. Once they do this kind of virtual uh, uh, painting or virtual discovery and so on, basically they control much better and much longer the, the body shaking. So during the experiment that they have, of course, the EEG and all the stuff. So it seems that uh, this is not a cure, but it's a treatment. So that uh, the feedback in the VR is completely different from the empirical work. And that's because the patient react much more and much better. So this study is, uh, and I was in touch with, with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's a medical lab uh, because uh, of uh, uh, Vicenza Ferrara and Marco Iosa, but uh, I believe that this kind of research is particularly uh, promising. And uh, we will work uh, on, uh, on a new project uh, at the National Etruska Museum of Villa Giulia, and we, we try to, to investigate more uh, the question we are discussing today including the perception of artifact, particularly that's one that we want to, to do in a real museum and not just in a virtual simulation. And, uh, and this is, a, but I, I believe it, it's close to, um, to, your, uh, to your question. Uh, um, did I answer 
properly uh, gizm. Uh, yes, thank you. It was uh, also fascinating to hear about this new uh, project coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. I think we are reaching the end of our uh, seminar, but I, we have uh, some space left. So please take the, your chance to ask questions to the father of cyber archaeology. So that's your opportunity. May I? Yeah, if absolutely, Eleonora. For you. Um, well, thank you, Maurizio, again for everything and this uh, workshop today. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned it at the end of your presentation about using Mozilla Labs for uh, you know lessons because uh, we were discussing this uh, recently I, did you try it how, how was it do you think it's a very because i i think uh, as a browser tool this could be like really um useful for students even like it's a different way for them to enjoy the class but also to learn so i just i was wondering about your experience with this no thanks eleonora um Actually, I, I discussed uh, about uh, Mozilla also with uh, National Endowment for the Humanities recently and uh, Epic Games uh, Unreal, which is actually uh, a fantastic platform uh, um, I'm just starting to use and, and, and we have some ideas with them because uh, they have uh, the headquarters actually 20 minutes from my home. So <laughs> I, I hope one day I can visit them, but that's, now it's not possible. But um, I use uh, Mozilla Apps uh, in two classes, so I can just tell you briefly what uh, was my experience. And, and uh, this, uh, this is one of the very few positive aspects of the of the COVID. So we, uh, so the situation was so desperate that we were all forced to invent something because uh, Zoom was not enough, you know, and particularly in a situation where you want to uh, have student to interact with artifacts and so on. Uh, my screenshot here is uh, uh, is is from Mozilla Hubs. So uh, I teach a class. Uh, uh, well, I taught more than one, but this was a class on Etruscan archaeology, and the sarcophagus of the Sposi was the artifact in the middle. So I use uh, 3D models and uh, videos and slideshow, and uh, so it, I I start to populate the room with uh, uh, different media, and uh, so we had a class. Uh, uh, for m most of us was uh, a desktop uh, uh, experience, but uh, if you have, of course, a, a, a virtual reality headset, the experience is completely different. And um, so we purchased some of them for the student and they, they had this uh, uh, the interaction by immersive interaction by the headset. The result was uh, very appealing. Um, the, the slide I, I show, it, it's just a, for now, it's a concept. Uh, it's not yet a, a, a project, but it will be a project soon, I believe, because, uh, again, the question is important, but uh, I want that this community, uh, this audience can understand this. That's much more than I. So there are other groups working on Mozilla Labs, uh, and, and they actually made my choice more convincing because uh, um, there's a lot of investment in uh, in uh, and in this kind of platform because it's open and because in the future we will grow and you can separate rooms so you can have uh, uh, technically endless uh, virtual space so the student reacted very well so there was a uh, uh, of course, not a class based on that, but uh, we we organized some seminars, and the result was uh, was beautiful. I would love uh, to link the repository, 3D repository, with a real artifact with uh, so digital real artifact with uh, um, with the uh, with uh, a collaborative space. So, uh, uh, the director of the University of Michigan Press uh, uh, title uh, this connection, I, I propose the engagement layer. And I, I like to quote him because I believe the engagement layer is a great definition when you have a real 3D database from one side, uh, which is scientifically based, parametric, but from the other side, you have a, a simulation space where you can have 
other uh, elements, other media, not necessarily just the repository. So, so our idea is uh, for now, for example, if we create a tool for uh, searching in, uh, in a repository, specific categories of finds or, or, uh, or I'll 3D data set, then we can visualize them in Mozilla Hubs and then we can see them floating in a room and perhaps in combination with uh, other maps. Because for example, I'm struggling to see an alternative to GIS for a different audience. And GIS cannot be a final publication. Of course, we cannot skip it. Everything is, is uh, geospatial uh, in archeology. span So it has to go in the GIS, but cannot be the final platform and particularly if we use a commercial platform like Esri that, you know, they, uh, but so this could be another way to visualize uh, maps and, and layers. So to have a, a sort of a publication space engagement layers, and then you can keep all your data in a web JS uh, for, for the usual, uh, the usual uh, activity and, uh, and, and so on. So in, again, it's just one year so not, uh, of experience, but uh, it was uh, it was positive, and uh, it's related also with new archaeology because the, right now we are finishing the Francois tomb in uh, in uh, Mozilla Hubs with another group of students that will present this tomorrow in a uh, showcase uh, online, and this could be studied by eye tracking too. So we want to see if the e-learning is different in a collaborative space versus uh, a non-collaborative space. Basically, if, you, if it can, I, I can talk with others, I can see others in the same room. Um, some, is it the same, is different? Uh, is it a distraction or not? So some, it will take a while uh, to, to, to do that, but that's the, the purpose. So this is the Mozilla chapter. Thank you, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. I have a question, may I? Absolutely, Lisa. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Maurizio, for, uh, for your amazing presentation. Um, I have a question about the, um, the use of um, the emotive inside with the Bray computer interface. And even if um, in part you have already answered. So, but uh, as you explained, the brain computer interface technology is um, used to explore the state of mind in several disciplines. Okay, but do you think that the with EGG is possible to to mapping not only different personal interests, uh, for instance, what we have seen with the eye tracking, etc., but also emotional categories? during a visit in an archaeological site and so creating uh, patterns maybe uh, according to different mental states in particular context and i mean mm, there are authors that uh, demonstrate uh, that also emotions are a kind of dynamic state of mind um, connected with the environmental and cultural context and so mm, the other question is if with this tool for you is possible to communicate to also to the present community the awareness of those places in which also people live today thank you yeah thanks elisa uh, you know it's a it's a very complex uh, question and uh, i believe the eg is an insufficient in my view to um to answer uh, a, a so uh, important question because, uh, well, first of all, in, in terms of EEG, emotion are the catalyst, are not uh, the object of investigation, right? So what I'm saying is that it's true what you're saying, that experience uh, uh, and engagement is completely different. There are a lot of studies, neurological studies about empathy that we know that, but there's not just based on EEG, they're based on skin sensor, for example. Uh, blood pressure, uh, heart frequency. There's a combination of factors that they can tell you more about that. Because, for example, when uh, I don't, I, I don't say that uh, again. From what I understand, of course, uh, now, uh, the AG doesn't. Uh, uh, sorry, the, any emotion doesn't have an impact in the AG. It, it does, but uh, the problem is that uh, you need to identify in which. Uh, which electric activity is related to that. So we don't have a, a segment that can tell you exactly what happened there. So this is more complicated to track simply by that. Uh, 
So the experience uh, uh, in the Duke labs, uh, so the most advanced lab, not uh, the archaeology, the archaeology one. So the ones at the hospital where they, they treat a lot of patients, also sport is a part of that. For example, uh, 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 players under stress, they have a lot of, uh, they, they have a different reaction to, uh, to the performance, right? So that's why they study that by, but they combine um, MRI, EEG, skin sensor, and so on, because this is part of the of the complexity of the emotional world inside us. And uh, so, and unfortunately, the EEG is too simple, basically, in, uh, in order to give you uh, the, the complexity of response that you look, uh, you're looking for. So again, I, we have a, a brief, ex, a short experience with insight. So and uh, and um, and I'm happy that we are able at least to catch uh, some waves uh, and uh, we see the waves. But when you see the wave, you don't know if it happens because of a different emotional uh, interaction. But might be, I don't know. But there's no way that you can track it for sure in the specific uh, profile of the EEG. So it would be interesting to combine a uh, uh, different sensor in, the, in, in a case like that, I believe, uh, and uh, which is really very possible. I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, extremely difficult, but that, that could be eye tracking somehow can be, uh, I would say, more useful in a certain way, because, uh, for example, uh, uh, when in my art history classes, I use uh, when I start to use a specific subject, when I see the eye tracking change completely, if we use their human subject in a picture or non-human subject, or for example, the famous picture, the kiss, you know, the, uh, uh, so this is an example where, you know, the eye tracking became extremely interesting because uh, um, the camera tracking was all about the kiss and not about the rest of the picture, but also the way you see the eight maps is, is somehow uh, intriguing. So again, I'm, uh, I, would, I would learn from you guys when you started, but uh, I think you, you need uh, a combination of, uh, of, of, uh, of devices and uh, not just that, because it would be too simple for you. Yeah, thank you. I am absolutely agree with you. So <laughs> thank you again. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, that's a nice question. Very nice question, by the way. Yeah, we need more time and more devices. So that, that for sure. Um, if there are no further questions, then I really thank you uh, once again, Maurizio, for this fascinating talk. So, I mean, um, I'm a little bit dizzy from the range and uh, of your reflections here. And I always try to see parallels to my universe of philology. And uh, I think there are. So I think there's a lot to learn from archaeology. And we are really at the forefront here. Um, so thank you very much also for this lively discussion and the, the excellent questions here from, from the audience. Um, this will, oh, this is my daughter. I'm sorry. Uh, this is being recorded and um, you can watch everything again. So if you uh, are afraid to have missed something. Uh, also, if you share the slides, we could upload them to do, to GitHub to our repository. Otherwise, they would be visible with, with YouTube. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next seminar will be uh, in two weeks, and uh, the presentation will be delivered by our local hero, Tiziana Mancinelli. And the title will be From Modeling to Publishing Digital Scholarship in Practice. So everyone uh, very welcome in two weeks, uh, same place, same hour. And yeah, Maurice, I hope we will be uh, able to meet and discuss uh, or uh, um, in presence somewhere in Italy, in Venice. So please uh, consider our center, your, your um, home, <laughs> so to, to where you always can come. So friends and uh, you are always a most welcome guest, so that I'm, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, uh, so many colleagues and friends and here. And I know that you're doing great things. Um, I, I will visit you uh, uh, sooner or later. So we'll, Wonderful. We'll be in touch. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, we will be in touch. Very good. Thank you.